Thank you so much, Anna. It's such a pleasure to be here and see uh, the continuation of this series. Uh, I've been a big fan myself and happy to be part uh, of the moderation and maybe speaking a little bit from my experience in gig also on um, managing of a network and the sustainability of the global innovation gathering. Um, so we have today with us Tom Hansing, the co-founder of this association of open workshops in Germany, um, also uh, an active, uh, the director of the Anstiftung Foundation, uh, and supposedly joining us, and I hope later it would be Felista Akko, uh, she's the senior partnership manager at AfriLabs, uh, uh, based in Nigeria, and also AfriLab is one of the notorious networks uh, that exist, combining many African hubs. Uh, and have been around for almost 10 years now. So I think until um, we have the second speaker, I'd be happy if Tom, you can take the lead and maybe introduce yourself a little bit more and tell us more uh, on the Association of Open Workshops Germany. Yeah, thank you, Fadia. Thank you for the invitation. Um, I have to clear that I'm, I'm not the director of uh, Anstiftung. It's a foundation uh, and I'm employee of the foundation for more than 12 years now. But I'm, in fact, um, one of the co-founders of the Association of Open Workshops. So I'm Tom. I'm working and living in Berlin. Working is not correct. I'm working in the in whole Germany and other uh, networks. Um, my origin is it's is more uh, the social sciences and an and truly practical approach because i'm uh, a founder of an open workshop in berlin for for arts and crafts for silkscreen printing um uh, the 2006 that was it's, it's some time ago but still fresh in my head because it was like my initiation to the to the worlds of uh, DIY cultures and uh, sharing knowledge sharing space sharing tools and sharing um, a common experience in giving opportunities to others and enjoying uh, working together so I will give you a brief introduction in the more or less history of the Association of Open Workshops. I can share a link because we recently translated some parts of the page in English, which is good because it's a German network and everything was in German language only. Uh, that was a big mistake in fact, but so we're uh, actively changing that. So um, I will make it quick. When I started with my own open workshop, I thought I invented something completely new. Me and my friends, we believed that what we are doing, creating a space where everybody can join, bring in their experiences, knowledge, skills, and do awesome uh, things together is something completely new. Nobody else had this idea of creating this, what we called an open workshop. And after a few years, I uh, experienced, oh, yes, it's great, but no, we're not the, the first movers. In fact, there's a variety of other open workshops and like-minded open space initiatives but we don't know each other. And we don't know what the ideas, what the, the core values of these uh, initiatives really are and why they do what they do. We, we knew what why we do what we do, but not what the others think. And that was the first step in creating uh, something like a network. Uh, in between, I became an employee of the Foundation Anstiftung, which uh, is um, dealing and working with DIY cultures. They are supporting and uh, giving grants and are doing research about different types of um, do-it-yourself and do-it-together cultures in Germany. And there were nine uh, workshops of uh, different size and different topics and different, uh, let's say, gusto of community. 
And we sat together, um, it was an invitation of Anstiftung. That was before I worked for this foundation. Okay, it's, I have to sort it out. Um, and we, we talked about a lot, a whole weekend about our core values, about what we do and why we do it. And we experienced, hey, we are very, very diverse and we're different, but somehow also same, same. And what we want to do together is to bring out the message, hey, come on, share your space, share your knowledge, open up, become diverse, bring more possibilities to other people in whatever you do. And did, that was the starting point of the association of open workshops. That was a, a loose connection of nine different projects. The one was, uh, in fact, in the beginning, there was an Italian project too. Um, and after some years, we experienced, um, we have some, not only some core values that we share, but there are some obstacles or some challenges or some things we have to clear for all our different types of open spaces. Why don't we join forces and create solutions that work for us as open workshop in general? And that was the first brick to create something like uh, the topic of our talk today, of our meeting today is sustainability and business models. Um, I wouldn't use uh, both of the terms. It was more or less the the, the funding, the, the the core idea for something like an operating system. We found things that we all challenge, and with where we need is some 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 clearness and some solutions for um, that work for different types of open workshops. And so we created the first solutions for for us as a community, as a network. That was 2012, and it uh, got along with the founding of a um, legal entity. Beforehand, there was no legal entity. And with this legal entity, we could create uh, more of these solutions for other workshops that work. We uh, gathered useful resources, um, materials, links um, that work for the for the organization teams of open workshops. Not for the for for the using people, not for the visitors and users, but for the people who are in charge of different uh, topics in the in the open workshop world. And this worked quite good. We have a lot of resources, information for others. And the other part was that we constantly intensified the connection by creating reasons together to, to, to have events like where we meet, a yearly meeting, and we created local and regional uh, networking events so that people get to know each other. Because it's good to, to have um, uh, an URL or something like a, a flyer or uh, that kind of stuff, for sure, that's good. But to, to really get in contact and to really know what others think and to create something like a network, it's very essential to that the, the people meet, that they can get in contact in person, that they know the faces, how the... Uh, voices sound and what they really think um, and not with a very strict program like a conference where you have a lot of input and workshops and talks but the in-between things are the most important in our experience and this is what we do um, for years now to create these uh, events where people can join um, this is um, all supported, lucky wise, from uh, the Foundation Anstiftung, which is giving a yearly grant, like a core financing finan financing thing, like a fundamental money that we can use. But uh, later we created also um, like um, the possibility to 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 not earn money but to to create money for the organization itself one example is uh, our insurance system because we have a group insurance that works for every single 
um, workshop, they they pay less. They pay a lot less if they go to the market and um, sign um, an insurance contract on their own. And some parts of this um, money that they don't have to pay for the insurance goes into the uh, funding for open workshops for the, for the association itself. And uh, this is what we also try to create more and more useful tools and solutions and um, things you can use for your own workshops um, locally. Um, and you, you, you spare effort. And this is what you can give back to the association because there is this, this solution is created. And this is why I don't say this is a business model, but this is an operation uh, an operating system because we don't we just want to to achieve like sustainability in in the core funding. There is no need to create surplus. Nobody needs to have profit. The profit is that we create values and that we create solutions that work for many, if not all of the open workshops. Maybe this is as an introduction. This is an amazing introduction. It touches already on so many points. Uh, uh, when we were having the discussion around the importance of this episode, we came exactly on the point that's uh, of what's the difference between sustainability and a business model, uh, especially this is being hosted as part of the business model talk. And, and then the idea was that we think in a more in a broader term on on what does it take for uh, networks and their organizations to, to, to survive. And definitely non-monetary input and resources is, is another resource that needs to be taken, I think, um, into consideration. Um, so it's not just the money, it's the efforts and the time that members put into these networks. And this is something that's very, uh, you can see so clearly, for example, an organization like GIG, which I'm happy to also share later on uh more details on thank you so much um for this great um uh, introduction to the talk today and we have joining us the second speaker today felista uh thank you so much for joining i understand that there was a confusion with the time zone so thank you so much for being able to accommodate this and uh still make it to the talk we're happy to have you with us um Felista, we're, we're uh, happy to have, we had Tom Hansing from uh, the Organization of Open Workshops in Germany talk about how the, the network came to be uh, and how briefly he touched on how it's surviving and, and the model of sustainability so far. Uh, would you be able, being one of the early employees of um, AfriLabs, maybe would you be able to give us a background on how did AfriLabs come to be? What was the need for it to exist? How did that happen? Uh, and maybe also a, a quick uh, look or insight into how is it surviving almost 10 years? And correct me if it's correct. Yeah. Okay. Yes. Okay. Thank you so much. Um, and sincere apologies for joining late. I was reaching out for the next hour and then I saw that it was time, um, but I'm happy I'm able to join. Thanks for having me. My name is Felista Aku. I am the Senior Partnerships Manager for AfriLabs. AfriLabs is a Pan-African network of innovation hubs in Africa. And at the moment we have over 400 hubs spread across 53 African countries. So basically, AfriLab started in 2011 with just five hubs, you know, coming together because at the time, the idea of innovation hubs was still very nascent, you know, very early stage, and we had just very few of them. And they thought to themselves that how can we come together to support each other, share knowledge, share best practices, and grow basically. Um, so they came together and that was how AfriLabs was formed. And we have grown from five member hubs to over 400 hubs today. Uh, basically what we do as AfriLabs is we create a platform for connecting all of these hubs across the continent and providing various forms of support for them to better do the work that they do. 
and the work that they do is largely around um, providing various forms of support for entrepreneurs, everything from providing physical co-working spaces for startups to work from, to taking startups through either incub an incubation or an acceleration program, depending on the stages of the businesses, you know, to other things like mentorship, coaching, access to investment opportunities, and the likes. Um, how we have survived in the last 12 years, I mean, we, we are 12 years as an organization. We have different model, um, I would say, um, but one important thing about, if you talk about sustainability for networks, is you have to be able to establish what value is for your primary members, right? Um, because we get these questions a lot. Why, why should I join AfriLabs? So if you are not able to, in very clear terms, define why you exist and why your potential member should join your network, then you're losing it already, right? Um, we did, uh, we did a, a survey sometime in 2019 um, called Ecosystem Mapping, you know, where we try to understand the very... I think we've lost you, Felissa. I can't hear you for, yeah, I don't think. Felissa, can you hear us? Okay. Seemingly there is a technical connection problem. Maybe until then I can um, comment a little bit about what Felista brought into uh, the value. And I think this is the common thing between all three of us today representing three different networks. It's always a question of um, value. I think it's the common values that bring people together in, in, in life. Uh, maybe defining themselves as a community, a group of people that aim towards one thing. Um, and it's also a, a continuous question. And this was my experience with the Global Innovation Gathering, um, which I would introduce actually maybe shortly now. Uh, but basically, it as the, the network grew from, from a small group of people to almost now 170 members uh, joining from different parts of the world, this question of value, what value do we provide, why do we exist, was a, a, a question that had to be revisited and still is being revisited until this moment. And I think this process in itself and, and the adaptability to kind of uh, re-evaluate our existence as a network and what we could offer is uh, one of the reasons why I would say the network, unlike so many networks that started, was able to survive for 10 years. Uh, Tom, you've also spoken about, you know, the group of nine members or nine people that came together and you said we found that we had something in common. What was that common thing? And why, what was different this time? What made you feel the urge or the need to establish something around it? And then you said that later on, as years pass by, you try to establish a legal entity. And I would also love to inquire more about the reasons um, of you going in this direction. Yeah, thank you, Fadia. Thank you for the question. It's pretty pretty similar, the starting point with a, with a few spaces that join and, and ask how can we support each other what what is why should we support each other and what we experienced is that there are different approaches to diy cultures so um like felista told there is a, a big support for startups for um, providing spaces um what they do now and uh, giving coaching um Parts of the the founding members thought so, like thought alike that it's uh, important to have like open innovation, to 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 foster the the quicker start into market into uh, product innovation and helping people to to create their business model for what they create inside the open workshop. 
but others said, okay, this, this, this is not our cup of tea. We are not um, willing, it's not our aim to support startups. To, to, we don't want to support creation of products for markets and to, to create businesses. No, we think it's more or less uh, um, a fundamental right to have a space where, can, where you can develop and experience your own skills, your talents, your interests, and where you can do things with others without uh, a third or a fourth idea. So how you can sell that in the future or why this makes sense to, to enter a market or something. And all these different perspectives created this core value. What it's all about is a free space. It's a space, it's tools, it's um, a meeting on eye level there is no teacher and um, somebody who is a smaller one who has to learn from the big knowing person. No, it's an, it's an empowerment on eye level, whichever purpose is coming later. And the core value is this is what we believe in that is important for, for us personally on an individual level to, to, uh, to, to bloom as a, as a person. And it's important to to create something like a sustainable sustainable society, really, because a lot of the uh, open workshops in in our starting point and also up to now are criticizing capitalism a lot, and they they don't so so they don't want to to push things further in this direction. They try to create alternative lifestyles, and. The open workshop is more or less the, the, um, the free space where you can discuss, where you can deal with it, with the different perspectives on it and have a common ground. This is the, the, the broad variety of opportunities for, you, for yourself. That was the, this is the core value and this is what the, the core differences also that we experienced right from the beginning. And it's an ongoing discussion. Incredible. I, I mean, from what we are talking about at the moment, I can see this like two tiers of values on values. So we're talking about the values that bring people together in the first place, these common values. And then when people come together, they think of themselves as a collective or a community or network, whatever we call, then there is a automatically a new layer of value that has to be established into that new entity that just created. Uh, and it's a uh, in, in how I read into it, it's a, it's like this this movement between both, between the main values that brought us uh, together in the first place, and and then the uh, the value that is established and manifested by this the collective of people. Uh, very very nice. Thank you so much, Tom, for this. I would love to remind the audience that the business model talks is meant to be a community talk, and in that sense, it's not uh, only speakers presenting, but we're also uh, welcoming the audience to raise their hand uh, if they have questions, if they would like to actually add also from their experiences. I see we have with us Frank uh, from Africa, Osh, and um, uh, many other people that I'd be happy to hear from. Yuri, who was also uh, just established an association uh, uh, for Ukrainian makerspaces in Ukraine. Uh, also, please, Yuri, feel free to jump in whenever you have a question or would love to introduce what you do. Felista, welcome back. I'd love to give you also maybe the Thank floor you. again to yeah. continue on the point before we open the floor for the audience. Okay. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes, we hear you perfectly. Okay, thank you. So I was saying um, that we have to think of establishing what value looks like for um, the target members. Um, the major business model for sustainability for us has been the membership, right? So we have a membership system where our members get to pay an amount on a yearly basis. So because these amounts don't come all at the same time, um, so basically we admit members into the network on a quarterly basis. So we do this four times in a year, right? It means there are specific hubs that get to pay 
you know, their membership January, February. So all year round, we have membership fees coming in, right? However, membership fees alone can never be sustainable for a network, right? Which is why it is important to look into other value added services, right? Um, for your members, but of course, by extension for the kinds of partners that you work with, right? Um, so for us at Afri Labs, for example, we carry out a lot of programs and projects that borders around innovation, entrepreneurship, and technology on the continent, right? And for us, we work with multi-stakeholder groups. So we work with the likes of development agencies, corporate entities, policymakers, academic institutions, and the likes. So whilst our primary membership are targeted at hubs, we have other stakeholders that we are actively working with. So we are able to come up with what value also looks like for these other stakeholder groups. So that when we are churning out interventions, they are happy to fund it, be aligned with the work that they do, right? Uh, I'll give a typical example. In February, uh, we launched a program called the Rev Up Women Program uh, which is funded by the Visa Foundation. So for them, they were interested in supporting um, gender-focused intervention. So what we did was we designed a program for early-stage female-led businesses on the continent, and then they were happy to fund it. For this, we're working in we're working in five countries in Africa: Nigeria, South Africa, Cameroon, Kenya, and DRC. And of course, we still had to bring on board our hubs as implementation partners. So these hubs pay this membership fee. However, there are a lot of other values they get to benefit from, you know, sponsorship to attend our annual event, for example, to opportunity to come on board as implementation partners for projects that we secure. And of course they get paid for their consultancy um, on such projects. So yeah, membership is key, but then other forms of, value added services so you can embark on projects in your areas of strength right for us at afri labs we carry our projects around capacity building policy advocacy you know research and the likes yeah incredible very nice this opens up so many questions i uh, want to give it before i continue asking my question uh to the audience mm -hmm. uh would I, I see Yuri posted a question here that I'm going to read out and maybe also collect another uh, question from the audience. So Yuri was asking Tom, what was what are the next three most uh, polar, I think maybe you mean popular services of the association after insurance? Like what other uh, forms of sustainability do you guys use other than insurance? Um, so maybe this is the first question. Um, someone else has another question for Tom or Felista. Okay, so until then, maybe Tom, you can answer the question directed to you by your. Yeah, and um, because apart from insurance, that was the the main thing. Insurance, uh, because this is where we where we can really earn money for the network itself. Um, the, the communication aspect is a very important thing. We uh, establish open source software that we host and maintain for all the network, uh, for all the spaces that are joining. So they don't have to care about these tools that they normally set up on their own and maintain on their own. We do that for, the, uh, for, our, for, for all our members. Um, it's like, I don't know which messengers you usually use signal telegram there are a thousand different types of um, messenger tools and we use matrix as an open source protocol that is able to do a lot of more than being just a messenger but we use this protocol and added um, a messenger on it and it's all single login so you don't have to to really have a lot of um knowledge about the internet tools to to use that and we maintain the software and same with the um, cloud solutions for collaboration for sharing 
uh, files and working together on like texts, uh, Excel, whatever you do and share share uh, different types of, of files. And there are some other things in, in progress. We're um, establishing a software solution to create open educational resources to more or less combine all the different sources for our materials in one software solution more or less and to create what you need on your own as a as a free service open educational resources i hope this is a, a term that uh, is is more or less common to to share things uh, materials on which you can learn whatever it's not propriety it's it's open for everyone and last thing next thing is a, a open source ticketing so not Eventbrite, but <laughs> Pretix, <laughs> but it uh, and we will host it on on our own. But it's, it works only for um, non-commercial um, events, courses, and opportunities that open workshops want to share. Amazing. On this point of hosting services or uh, infrastructure, let's say that might be relevant to the members, uh, is this kind of hosting? funded by uh, the Anstiftung Foundation or other foundations, or is it uh, the collective work, or do you allow members to contribute to the hosting of that infrastructure, whether with their time again, or maybe uh, even developing the solution? How, how does it work out of curiosity? So there is this core funding from Anstiftung, and there is some additional funding that the um, the employees collect more or less. They apply for grants and develop things in in the form of a project. There are different uh, other other foundations where you can get money to create things, and um, more and more parts of this ongoing maintenance are are um, carried by the contributions by the fees, the member fees membership fees and Sorry. a lot and a lot of unpaid voluntary work <laughs> a lot it's such an interesting uh topic because just recently we were talking uh with ricardo and some gig members about the global about our gig infrastructure and this came up in the topic of FOSS on how many of uh, the open source softwares out there are developed actually by voluntary works and the complexities that come with that and the maintenance that is not part of uh, the calculation uh, at the beginning. Maybe there's something also that we can tackle uh, at certain points uh, if we have time. I know Frank um, raised their hand and there is a question from Riz in the chat. So maybe Frank, you can go first. Uh, thank you, Fadia. Uh, am I audible? Okay, cool. Thanks. Uh, thank you, Anna, also for personally inviting me. And thank you to both our, um, our speakers. Uh, my question is for Felista. Um, thank you for, for your for your talk. Uh, what I, I wanted to, to ask was, uh, in terms of financial sustainability for Afrilabs, I know you talked about uh, membership fees, and you also talked about value added services, which I think is is, is a really amazing uh, initiative. But what I wanted to know is, does Afrilab uh, develop programs and initiatives that align with the values of uh, external organizations so you don't us uh NGOs for for funding. And if if that's the case, uh, what are these projects that I feel up embarks on? And I know you gave an example, but I'm trying to understand what type of project I feel up uh embarks on, i.e. capacity building projects or policy briefs or research endeavors. What what exactly is that value added services that Afri Labs uh provides to uh stakeholders for financial sustainability yeah thank you so much uh, for the question um uh, so basically, can, can you hear me yes i i was uh, gonna suggest just that we also combine this with a very similar question that was posted uh, an excellent question that was posted in the chat by riz who was also 
uh, asking how do, do you continue to base, um, um, so if the budget comes from public funds, donors, and other international and private foundations, uh, how do you still remain focused and mission driven uh, with the focus on members, on the interest of members? Maybe this also links a little bit to what Frank is talking about. Yeah, absolutely. Yes, please confirm that you can hear me. Yes, we can hear you. Okay, great. Um, so basically, in terms of our value added services, um, we do a couple of things. Uh, um, this year, for example, we will be launching the Afri Connect platform. We did a soft launch last year during the Afri Labs annual gathering in Zambia. And the Afri Connect platform is a digital platform designed to connect um, all the relevant stakeholders of the African innovation and entrepreneurship ecosystem. I'll give a context to this, right? So whilst hubs are our primary members, one of the strategic roles AfriLabs has played in the ecosystem in the last 12 years is that we have served as a convener, facilitating cross-stakeholder collaboration between all the relevant stakeholders. Um, because everything we do at AfriLabs is geared towards raising successful entrepreneurs, right? But we understand that the task of raising successful entrepreneurs is not such that a single stakeholder group can achieve. So ESOs can't achieve, it, achieve that alone. Um, um, policymakers alone can't do it. Corporate entities can't do it. But we also realize that all of these stakeholders have a role to play. So we create a platform for all of these connections to happen and you know, look for ways to collaborate, work together, amplify the work that each other is doing, complement the work that each um, other partners are doing, right? And one of the platforms we do this is through our annual gathering that happens in October of every year. By the way, this year, the event will be happening from 11th to 13th of October in Kigali, Rwanda, right? So this is a need that we saw. So we decided to take it a, a step further by creating this digital platform where all of these stakeholders can sign up, create their profile, and then over time we can, you know, share resources. Share resources. Sorry. Please continue. Okay, share resources, share tools, share best practices, and of, of course, over time we can query the platform and get data, right? So for a start, this platform will be free, but over time it's going to be subscription-based. Right. Um, so this is one of the things we do. We also have a consulting and advisory arm. Right. We've done this for this long and we work with multi stakeholder group. So we have the capacity to consult and advise on different matters around innovation, entrepreneurship and technology. It could be as basic as, you know, a startup or a brand that is looking to enter a new market in Africa and you know, are trying to check, okay, how do we go about it, right? Um, beyond the work that we do in Africa, we're also very big on facilitating cross-border collaboration. So Africa, Asia, Africa, Europe, Africa, America collaboration, and then seeing how we can strengthen all of these engagements. Regarding the question around um, the fact that we are heavily dependent on, you know, support and fundings from our donors? How do we ensure that we still keep the interest of the hubs at heart? Um, if there is one thing I am very certain about at Afri Labs is that in everything that we do, we try to make sure that we do not deviate from our mission and our vision, right? Um, yes, we are sector agnostic. You know, we've done projects around agriculture, education, climate action, you know, um, mobility, gender, and the likes. But at the heart of everything we do, it is geared towards innovation. It is geared towards entrepreneurship. It's geared towards technology, right? Um, worthy of mention is the fact that we never really carry out any projects without leveraging our hubs. I gave example of the Visa Foundation program. When we got it, we, uh, 
we are implementing the project in five countries, two cities per country. So what we did was to do a call for application to the network and put out specific criteria of the kinds of hubs we are looking for. And then, you know, the applications came in, we set up an independent reviewing committee and, you know, hubs were selected to implement this pro project. So everything we do, we have the hubs at the center of it. And if it, it's, if it doesn't have the interest of the hubs that has, then we're not gonna do it, right? So all projects, all programs, all initiatives, interventions are generally, um, in sync with our overall mission and vision. And of course, the hubs are at the center of everything we do at AfriLabs. Amazing, thank you so much, Felista. Um, I I have several questions in my head. This is really uh, interesting. And I think I'm, I'm gonna start uh, with something that might be a little bit obvious uh, given the title uh, of the, the, the episode today, but what does sustainability mean for networks? So uh, if, if we think of uh, open workshops in Germany, what does it mean to remain sustainable? Where, where are we heading to? That is the question. We, we sometimes say surviving, being sustainable, uh, but, what are we trying to be sustainable for? And uh, if if uh, maybe Tom, you have an answer to that, where does your sustainability take you in open uh, workshops, Germany? Um, yeah, I'm, I don't have the answer, but maybe an idea what it's about. Um, and it's about to, to overcome sticky information. So, uh, that it's that the the ongoing uh, process is not dependent on certain people with a certain knowledge, and also not on certain people with a certain power, and I mean power in a in a in a, in a form of engagement, enthusiasm, fire for for the network. It should the I think the key thing for the sustainability of a network is that you don't have a, a head office more or less uh, and not one like a, a hierarchy with a with one spike but you have like a, a field with a lot of spikes and everyone is able to to transport to be like the um, ambassador for the, for what it's all about himself or, her, or herself and this is easy said, but very, very different to really establish because it, everything depends on money, on um, access, and also access to the to the thinking of stakeholders. A lot of things are driven by lobbying, and the grassroots initiatives, what we care about a lot, they don't have this lobby. This has to be established step by step by step, and it's a long way. So, but but this is the the core thing I think to create this what we can call sustainability for the network. Incredible. So, if I can put it in my words somehow, so aiming to be more decentralized in terms of the operations and the holding of of the network, would that make sense? Uh, so, the power of a network lying within the members choosing to be part of the network and having a level of sovereignty somehow, a level uh, of um, authority or or decision-making within a network, would that also be something that translates what you're talking about, Tom? Absolutely. Yes, yes, it translates it uh, in a very good way. The, the, the development of the organization has to tackle the how are decisions made and who is in charge for what and it's uh, it's really um difficult to have this uh this this powerful people with your push, pushing things forward but then they have to 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 give that to let loose to, to let it go to, to let others take action and to be in charge and make these decisions and this also means that you have to be f friendly for failure. You have to accept that it's not all professional uh, things. 
you have to to create like a, a friendly environment that 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 failure is is loved and also valued because this is where how you learn and people gain a lot of um human i don't ah the, the words are missing human capital the if you talk a lot with with stakeholders and and the like you you gain something and in fact a lot of people have to gain this self consciousness this power to talk to other people even if they don't are uh, officially in charge but they this is how they become in charge if the, uh, by by doing it and so the yeah it has to be um the the power has to be spread thank you so much for for the input Again, so many points that we could drift into, but uh, uh, for the sake of time, I'm going to uh, ask Flüster a similar question and, and put this maybe uh, more into the contents, uh, context of uh, the fact that you operate within a continent, right? So what, what does sustainability mean to Afri Labs? How do you how do you want to ensure that you're sustainable in the future? And what do you think are the main challenges, or maybe not challenges, but maybe the the nuances of of operating such a network in Africa? Um, yeah, thank you for the question. So basically, um when we talk sustainability for a network, what comes to mind for me is considering the fact that we are nonprofits, right? And we have a team of people we work with to be able to do the impactful work that we do. Sustainability for me is how are we able to generate enough revenue to keep us afloat while we do this impactful work, right? Like I mentioned earlier, uh, membership fee can never cut it. Like it really can never cut it because at the moment, for example, you know, we have a secretariat, we have um, over 40 staff with over bulk of them working out of Nigeria, then a couple of teams in other countries like, you know, Morocco, Egypt, Ghana, and a couple of other African countries. Um, so the amount we need you know, to cover operations is quite huge, right? And that for us is core. So what we do is, I don't know how other people, other organizations do it, but for us at AfriLabs, when we carry out projects and programs in the budget, we usually put a 15% of the total budget. And that goes into, uh, we call it facilitation fee or administration fee. And that goes into our operations, right? To cover things like, you know, salary, um, um, cost of um, rent for the office and things like that, right? Yeah, so um, we look for ways to ensure that, you know, we are basically kept afloat um, in the work that we do. And I mean, we've done this for 12 years. <laughs> um, it's, it's no joke, right? So that is um, what I think about when we talk about um, sustainability for Afri, Afri Labs. Um, you asked the question that, you know, what are the challenges? Hmm. Um, I would even speak from the point of my direct position as um, partnerships, fundraising, business development, you know, for an organization. Um, like you know very well, you could check all the boxes you know, have everything right, but then you do not own the heart of anyone. You do not have the their decision power, right? You can't tell when, you know, they're going to release the funds. You know, a lot of things can happen. We've had situations where, you know, you start talking about a funding opportunity from, say, January. And at January, everything looks very promising. And in your mind, you're thinking, okay, plus or minus by February the money should be down, project starts by March. But a lot of times things don't go that way, especially when funding is involved. And one of the things we've seen at AfriLabs, considering the fact that we are working with a multi-stakeholder group, we have learned a lot of things over time. You know, the approach that different entities use, 
um, for their procurement and their approval processes, the time frame, and things like that. So that could be a lot challenging, right? Where you have to just keep moving things. So you you make your plan and say, okay, this should be ready by February, but then it doesn't come until June, July. So what do you do? So what we've seen is that we are very agile <laughs> in our processes. You know, we make quick decisions. We pivot very quickly. We test things very quickly. We learn and then we move on very quickly. So if there's anything I'm going to say, if you're running a network, you have to be super agile. And then um, you do not you do not hire until it is absolutely important. You do not rent a space until it is absolutely important. Like you, you want to be as lean as possible. Yeah, you have to, you want to be as lean as possible so that, you know, whatever you're putting money behind is something that is absolutely important. Otherwise, you can skip it, you know, find alternative ways of getting it done. Um, if there is something you're thinking of, a role you're thinking of hiring for, you could consider getting a contract staff, for example, on a project to say, okay, I have this project, it's gonna be on for six months, get additional hands for the six months. When the job is done, you let them go. And then you just keep your team lean, only hiring for the core um, roles that are important, right? Um, I hope I've been able to answer the question. Did I miss anything? Uh, please let me know, I'm happy to respond to them also. No, amazing. Thank you so much for sharing uh, so openly and gen generously. Uh, we have a question from Nadite. So Nadite, please. And also, yes. always feel free to introduce yourself before the question if it's important for the context. Okay, yeah. Um, well, I'm Nadite. I run an organization called Hagush, uh, which is based in New York, operates in low-income countries, and we provide access to uh, digital technology uh, for young people in low-income countries. And uh, the way we do this is through uh, offering financial services. So buy now, pay later is the model that we provide, for instance. Um, so my question is for um, Felissa. And I am curious to learn how the process of engaging the different st stakeholders you said initially in the very beginning stages of Afri Labs, I imagine you guys were probably uh, figuring out things on the go in real time. And so I'm curious about how you um, were navigating, engaging with different stakeholders and communicating the potential values that you could provide for them. So not your members, but the other stakeholders. Um, so that's the first part of the question. Uh -huh. And then, um, I also would like to know if you have like some uh, quick uh, rules of thumb of how to navigate those spaces of like communicating your values, uh, like the values you can potentially provide to different stakeholders. Uh, yeah, so those are the questions. Um, I lost you for a bit. It's okay, um, I'll quickly go through the questions. Basically, I uh, want to know, because you said you have like the, you have your members, and also you provide value to other stakeholders. So I'm curious how in the very I, early- I, I, I think I got your question. How do we communicate okay. value to different stakeholders? Am I correct? Yes. So that's the very, yeah, first question. Melissa, I think we just lost Melissa. Hope we should be able to reconnect again. Uh, in the meantime, Tom, you have your hand raised. Yeah, I have a question to to all of you. Um, uh, if I understood right, Felista is she she said raising su successful entrepreneurs is one of the main aims, and also what Nad Nadai said. In, in it's to to strengthen the the power to 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 uh, to make a living more or less does it work out is my question because we, i'm uh, sitting here in germany and the, the open workshop scenery is more or less in spare time it's like additional it's not for um 
it's it's a different game it's 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 a game it's not it's not the 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 all the the hard real life more or less so does it does it really work out to to find through open workshops path to uh, creating income for the people who are working and engaging in open workshops incredible question thank you so much tom for raising this uh, this is something that's very common at main networks that I've met where it's, it almost has to be like a side thing, right? Um, Anna, please go ahead collecting questions and points maybe before we go. Thank you. Yeah, I just wanted yeah, to respond, can I on... respond to the question that was asked earlier. Sure, go ahead, Felista. Calista, you have the floor, please. Okay, thank you. Um, to respond to the question, how do we communicate value to the other stakeholder groups that we work with? Of course, that's apart from the hubs who are our primary members. So first of all, we begin by doing a stakeholder mapping um, to first identify the stakeholder groups Right. So for us, we're talking about development agencies. We are talking about um, academic institutions. We talk about relevant government institutions like the Ministry of Digital Economy, Ministry of ICT, Ministry of Communications and such relevant ministries. Right. And then we have um, investors. Very important. Right. So after doing a mapping of all the stakeholder groups, then we begin to um, do like a research to understand what value would look like for them, right? So for corporate entities, for example, we realize that a lot of corporate institutions have, you know, different platforms or softwares that they would love for um, the startups that our members serve to take advantage of, right? So we came up with what we call corporate affiliate um, program. So we designed a corporate, corporate affiliate program specifically for corporate entities that would like to engage with our community to do one thing or the other. Last year, for example, Intel signed up. So that is also subscription based. So they pay to sign up to the corporate affiliate program, right? So Intel, for example, signed up to the corporate affiliate program last year. And for them, their interest was around, you know, deep techs. Um, these are startups with ideas around AI, robotics, machine learning, and stuff like that. Because um, they have a couple of tools that these guys can leverage for developing or building their solutions, right? So based on them signing up to this program, we did a couple of things for them. We had an investor roundtable in Kenya. We had a workshop for them in Nigeria. And we even did a research with them on evaluating the African deep tech ecosystem. And as I speak with you, the insights from that research is now feeding into further support that they are, that they are currently providing for our hubs. Because the results of that research showed that hubs did not quite have their capacity built enough to be able to support deep tech startups, right? So a lot of hubs, you know, you find them provide general business development um, training for startups. But when you come to when it comes to startups with specific needs, you know, they were not you know adequately prepared to support them. So they dare to do a train the trainer session on deep technology for our hubs. They've done for hubs in Southern Africa. They are currently doing another one in Kenya today, tomorrow, and next. And then they plan to do another in Egypt sometime next month. So that is for um, a corporate entity. Investor, for example, you know, we've seen so much funds is being churned into the continent, for example, but every investor want to protect their fund, right? You're far away in the US, you're investing in one startup in Lagos, Nigeria, You've probably never been to Lagos, Nigeria. You want some level of credibility. You want to be able to invest in a startup that, you know, someone you know or an organization of repute can say, we know this startup. They've gone through an incubation program or an acceleration program in our hub and they are doing X, Y, Z, right? So for investors, we have two platforms we've developed for them. 
as value addition. So we have the Catalytic Africa, which is a cross-stakeholder collaboration between Afri Labs and ABAN, the African Business Angel Network. So what we are doing with that platform is basically providing a matching grant. So we encourage our hub, our startups, after you know going through their program to be able to assess initial funding from an angel investor in their community. And then we match that investment in the ratio of two to one for investment of $10,000 or below, and then one for investment of $20,000, uh, dollars, 10 to 20,000. So for now, because we have of $20,000 um, for this first phase, however, we are still trying to get more contribution from other institutions into the pool so we can expand. And of course, we're also doing the AfriLabs Connect deal room where we are making available a pipeline of investable startups from our hubs and linking them with investors across the globe. Um, that also will be launched during this year's annual gathering. We already have partners like Futura who have um, who has um, a an investor network of over 20,000 investors globally. We have Nextera on board for that. So basically, for you to be able to add value to your stakeholder group, you have to begin with the mapping. After mapping, try to do specific research on what value looks like for them, and then think through, okay, how do I package this and present to them? And then you begin to meet them to say, look, I can do this for you, I can do that for you, if we enter this form of collaboration, and then you can take things forward from there. Wow, amazing. Uh, Anna, before I go on, you had something you wanted to say. Thank you. Um, yes, I just wanted to come in on um, the point that Tom made about um, his observation that um, in in Germany that the the open workshops are effectively um, for a hobby, um, and that what Afri Labs and um, uh, Hagush and and others are talking about is is more about you know really helping um, people to have economic sustainability. Um, firstly, I want to say that's very much what I've noticed. Um, so um, I have been involved in setting up makerspaces in the UK and then in Ghana and Kenya and Jordan and, and some other places. And um, it's I've definitely noticed the split that in most rich countries, the majority of makerspaces are um, hobby places for hobbies um, or for self actualization I guess like for people who want to kind of um, you know do something at the end of a day uh, of work or something um, and that in many um, developing countries that there is much more focus on on economic sustainability um, those are it, those are generalizations of course and there are exceptions um, I was involved in a maker space in um, a very poor area in South London um, in sort of like social housing and um, there was uh, you know there were definitely a lot of people involved there who were looking to to um, make a, a either make a living or to save money by being involved in the maker space like just to repair things and things like that um, so it's it's not an absolute split but it's it's definitely there um, and I I do you think that so your, your question Tom I think was does it work um I believe it does um with the caveat that we don't have enough systematic evidence of that yet um but for me that's one of the really important things to gather is the data that shows what economic impact um maker spaces and, and I mean Afri Labs is, is talking about um innovation hubs in, in general, not just makerspaces, but, you know, they can have, uh, uh, you know, and also Hagush with the impact um, of access to technology. I think these are all things that have a real material effect on um, people's uh, livelihoods, um, but that we need better data to, to make that case. Um, so, yeah, just that's what I wanted to come in and say. And if I can add to that, Anna, and also ask what is if if we can uh, measure the, the the impact that networks 
of such hubs have, if that also can be quantified into a kind of uh, economic value if we have to. And I also think we lack, maybe because I don't know, I haven't done enough research to know if there has been so many networks uh, similar to Afri Labs or uh, Open uh, Workshops Germany or even GIG. Uh, but it's also, um, this is something that GIG is facing, right? In the fundraising, we're a nonprofit organization that depends mainly on uh, fundraising and getting uh, grants so that we can uh, cover the costs of our employees and also uh, help support the network in, in as much as possible. Uh, also taking in mind the value of, uh, of members, what they need and what we can offer them and all of this, what we've been talking about so far. And one of the things... Uh, that has been um, a highlight of our conversation, our fundraising conversations in the past years is that it's so hard within the fundraising world and the donor world to find a category that would fund the network activities and not projects that are related to the network, right? So institutional funding that really values the importance of what we do, connecting members to each other, for them to exchange knowledge, exchange resources, or also just the human aspect that we've talked about, which is essentially is the essence of, of, of networks. It's, it's a gathering. Uh, and, and this is one of the things that each network has. So every lab is having they're gathering this month or next month. Um, Tom talked about also the workshops coming together. So the essence of a network is basically the meetup of these members and, and the coming together. Uh, uh, yet it still fails, at least in the existing fundraising that I've seen that I know of the funds that exist. Uh, I, I don't see a lot of funds being directed to fund uh, these kind of activities or maybe also because there is no understanding of the value, the added value that comes from uh, networks. And I don't know if, if this is something maybe Tom or, or, or Felista, you have something to say about, do you face problems uh, trying to convey to whoever, whether it's your foundation or the stakeholders, uh, do you, is it challenging to convey the importance of the work that you do or, or the value of being a network in such a world in the 21st century today? Yeah, I'm happy to respond to this very quickly. Um, I, I wouldn't say it's a function of being difficult um, to convey our value, but just a function of the fact that there are not a lot of funding just available to say, you know what, as an aggregator, as a network, we see the work you do and we have these funds, you know, to support you. You hardly see such funds. So most of the times, if you want to get funding, even the grants, they are project-based. They are program-based. So, um, you know, one of the funding that is most difficult for us to assess um, is operational grants, right? Situations where you are able to get some funding and they say, look, you know, we see the work you do, it's amazing. We want to contribute to your operational funds, you know, take this amount. It's it's just really difficult. So it's not really a function of them not seeing value in the work that we do, um, but that we haven't quite seen entities with such budget to say, this budget is for ESOs, not project-based where you have to, you know, do this program in five countries, pay this and pay that, but just to say they want to cover your your your, grant, your operations. I think, I mean, it's been a couple of years on this road, uh, business development. I would say I have seen just one entity that was, you know, willing to do that for us. And I, I am looking forward to seeing much more but for projects yes you see a couple of projects you bid like every other organization and then you're being reviewed if you feed you get it and you move on right but for operational grants yeah not not a lot of them have um are seen um um i can also answer in a quick way it's really hard to find an open ear at least for this core values and the main thing that the network is all about. You always have to translate that into projects, into programs that are set up and where some challenging uh, things are preset by the grant giving entity. And you have to identify how you evaluate your um, your success. 
So there is no open ear, in fact, because it's not, you cannot translate these softer values into profitable things. You really have to dig deep to find people inside these organizations which understand what it's really about. So yes, it's a it's an it's a big problem and it's an it's a challenge to to not give up in to, uh, always again and again telling these stories. It's all about this the storytelling about um, the 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 power of the networking and the network itself. You have to tell the stories. Then people begin to understand why their their stakeholder interests are maybe covered by supporting the network itself. Uh, again, this opens up maybe a whole discussion. So many questions popping in my head. This, uh, thank you so much for such an insightful conversation and very and sharing so openly. Also, um, just on this note, maybe uh, uh, briefly, um, I was wondering uh, if if also I think I'm losing the 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 question at the moment. So let me take a moment. Um, Anna, would you like to add something? I see you had a comment here on the function of funders, not seeing the value in making funds. Yeah, I was just um, thinking as I heard Felista talking about, um, you know, the lack of funds that are specifically available for um, for networks. And I, I think that, you know, if the funders saw more value in it or understood the value that networks can bring they would make more funding available for the networks so i, I you know i do think there's a, a relationship yeah there. Let, let me provide context to this yeah um one of our major supporters over the years has been giz right mm -hmm. in fact they have you know so much um interest in networks and um, are all for it, right? So in 2021, for example, during the Afri Labs annual gathering, not only were they one of our lead sponsors, but also they had like series of workshop um, trying to have engagement with national hub networks. So whilst we are um, the Pan-African network of hubs, um, a couple of countries have set up national networks. So Nigeria, for example, ISN, all the hubs in Nigeria under ISN, ASEC in Kenya, you know, GHN, Ghana Hub Network in um, um, Ghana, and um, a couple of other countries have been able to set up their network, right? Um, if you will look at it from the perspective of managing a network, we as Afri Labs will be very excited if every country, you know, are able to set up their network. So instead of managing over 70, 80 hubs in Nigeria, then we can make ISN a focal point and then we have them like that across the continent. So whilst GIZ, for example, is very interested in national network and its concept and have, you know, some funding for them, these funding are released for projects, that's what I'm saying. So these funds are released to support national network, you know, help those who have set up to develop, um, create convenience to help those who are yet to set up to understand why this is important, handholding, you know, knowledge sharing and all of those. So yes, they understand that this work is important. They are putting some funding be behind networks, however, they are tied to specific projects and not given necessarily as grants to support operations. I hope I've been able to clarify that. Yes, very much. Um, and actually on this point, going back to the, the idea that was sprouting in my head earlier, and I, I just feel like maybe that's an, a, a thought for food or idea to leave out there more than a question. Uh, I wonder if it's also the nature of the networks that are forming now and that are only possible because of technology, right? Because of the internet, because of the our ability to connect faster across uh, borders, but even across country, right? Like national, transnational uh would we maybe just saying that this could be also uh, part of um, the study itself? What kind of networks existed before that? 
what were they, what were they there for? What was the purpose of them? Because uh, humans connected always, right, in so many different forms. And now there's this, you know, like us coming together here today in this room, virtual room, and being able to connect uh, beautifully uh, is only possible because of that community and and, and network that we have uh, somehow. So is well, maybe. Would we say this is also new somehow having something that we can call Afri Labs that run across the African continent uh, long before we had railways running across countries in Africa easier, for example, or something like this? Would this also be maybe a, a thought that I can um, leave you with today? I mean, I personally believe the idea of network has been um, a thing for a long time, maybe not network of innovation hubs. I mean, network, community, you know, bringing people of like minds together to support each other, you know. Yeah, it's, it's, it's been a thing. Um, however, it's now on the content or what the focus of these networks are, right? Who are they? What do they want to do? What do they want to achieve? And I would also say that um, it's a lot more difficult at the beginning stage of every network, right? Because at that point, you are trying to prove your credibility. You're trying to, you know, tell the people that, look, I got this. I can do this. But at that time, you really do not have so much um, impact stories to tell, right? And I tell you, the truth is, eh, before a funder would put money behind you. They want to see track record. And this track record take, you know, some time for it to build. Um, I would say that the very early years of Afrilabs wasn't so easy, you know, when we started and we hadn't done a couple of, a lot of programs. So when you are trying to even apply for certain opportunities, they are asking you to list two, three, four, five examples of similar work done in this regard, and you have none to show for it, right? Um, so it becomes very difficult at such stage, but then it takes one funder to believe in you enough to say, okay, I can't see a track record just yet, but I, I believe in you that you can do this. And then they give you the opportunity to begin to create those track records such that you know future potential funders can, reference and say you know what because they've done this and done that and have worked with the likes of abc then i can trust them enough to put my money behind them but until then yeah it's it's really not um, an easy one thank you so much felista um i i think we're almost coming to the end of our call today uh, this has been such an insightful conversation, specifically for me uh, personally. I'm very interested, obviously, but also on a professional level, given uh, my role at GIG, uh, working as the community lead. All of these are questions, topics that I think about daily almost. And it's so great to see different networks coming together to discuss these because I wish actually we could create more opportunities for that so that we could connect and learn from each other and allow for the culture of failure that Tom mentioned also to exist in a very kind world uh, where we can grow and, and continue to adapt to the changing world around us. Uh, I thank everyone for coming. And before I end the call, I would like to hand over uh, back to Anna. And thank you so much, Anna, for giving me this opportunity to be part of the amazing series that you've uh, beautifully worked on for, for the past year. Thank you, Fadia. And uh, thank you to our speakers today, to Tom and Felista. Um, this has been a such an interesting conversation for me. Um, I've really enjoyed it. And I hope that um, that all of the participants have as well. Um, so thank you all for attending. This um, has been recorded and will be shared on um, the YouTube channel along with the other episodes. Um, we will be having another episode on um, the business models next month. And there's just something I wanted to mention very briefly before we end is that um, this series started um, as, uh, as an initiative um, to do with the MAKE project um, 
for which we have developed an open catalog of business models for um, maker spaces and small scale manufacturing. And we're looking to expand that into other ecosystem players such as, as hubs. Um, but I've got an opportunity at the moment that is focused specifically on um, maker spaces or, or workshops, um, which is for a six month mentoring program to develop or implement new business models. Um, and we mean business models in the sense of getting to a point of financial sustainability so that the hubs can keep operating and doing the good work that they do. It's not necessarily about making a, a profit, um, but it is about making sure that they're financially sustainable. And I think we can, we can't hear you anymore. You've you muted me. <laughs> so I've just posted a link in the chat to a document um, that explains a bit more about the mentoring program. So if any of you on here are involved in hubs yourself and are interested in it or have networks of hubs, um, maker spaces or workshops that you could share it with, um, then please feel free. The uh, closing date for applications is next Monday, but it's a very short application form. And so thanks again, Fadia, and to our speakers today and to everyone who's who's attended and contributed. So thanks so much, all of you. Bye-bye. Bye, everyone. Bye-bye. Congratulations, Fadia. <laughs>